In this episode, I want to talk about a really interesting issue that was recently brought to my attention by a listener. His name is Michael Fenske over in the UK. Big shout out to him for emailing me. This sent me down a mysterious and interesting trail to get to the bottom of why all English translations are unanimous in the way they treat Exodus 6, 3, which says in the ESV, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. But in Genesis, we see many times that the patriarchs refer to God as Yahweh, directly addressing him as such. So why would God say such a thing? This has led many scholars to make some very forced interpretations. But I want to propose in this episode a solution that's simple and elegant. I'm Andrew Case, and you're listening to Working for the Word. Now to orient us a little bit, let me read the wider context of Exodus 6.3. So here we go, starting in verse 1 in the ESV. But Yahweh said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am I am Yahweh your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am Yahweh. So let's get into the dilemma. Here are some verses that show a contradiction if we're going to take a straightforward reading of Exodus 6 3 seriously. Genesis 13 3. And there Abram called on the name of Yahweh. It's pretty explicit there. Genesis 15, 6. Then he believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Genesis 24, 26. Then the man bowed down and worshipped Yahweh. And he said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham. As for me, Yahweh has guided me. So remember, this is Abraham's servant who goes looking for a wife for his son. Genesis 26, 22, Isaac said, At last, Yahweh has made room for us. Jacob said to Isaac, Because Yahweh, your God, caused it to happen to me. Genesis 27, 20. Jacob saw this in his dream. Yahweh stood above it and said, I am Yahweh, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac, Genesis 28, 13. And there are many more. So this even seems to go against Exodus 3, 15. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. He doesn't say, tell them El Shaddai, the God of your fathers, sent me to you. Now, let's take a moment to just think about the logical implications within the context here. God is seeking to establish a relationship of trust with Moses so that Moses can trust God completely during his challenging future, beginning with facing Pharaoh. So, why would he start this relationship of trust by telling Moses 
that he now has a new name and that they're not going to recognize this name because he didn't reveal it to their forefathers. Instead, it would be logical for him to say, I'm Yahweh, the God that your forefathers knew. So that's why you can trust me to go forward, and that's why the people of Israel who are suffering can also trust you as my representative. Name recognition goes a long way when you're trying to establish trust. Okay, so that is the big dilemma that many scholars have been dancing around for a long time, trying to explain it and make it work with the rest of the meta narrative. Now, before we go further, we should read this in Hebrew and see what it is very literally. So, this last part of Exodus 6 3 typically reads once again as follows in English But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Of course, you know, I put Yahweh there, but the English versions are putting the Lord. We have in the KJV, but by my name, Jehovah, I was not known to them, NASB. But by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Net, but by my name, the Lord, I was not known to them. NIV, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. So, what is it in Hebrew? Ushami Yahweh lo nodati lahem. Okay, so very literally, this is what's going on. And my name, Yahweh, I was not known to them. Notice that in Hebrew, there is no preposition like by or according to here. That's an interpretational decision that's made by translators based on the bet preposition, so by or with, in the first part of the verse earlier where it says, Ba'el Shaddai, by El Shaddai. So in these translations, they're assuming that that bit preposition carries over elliptically or via ellipsis. Now, Dr. Austin Searles has actually written quite a bit about this. If you remember, he was on a past podcast interview, wonderful interview. I've learned a lot from his dissertation and from that conversation with him. So you can check out chapter four of his dissertation that is freely available online. It's linked in the description of that past episode. And in that chapter, chapter four, he discusses at length this whole verse and its issues. Now, going back to the Hebrew, the verb yada, which is to know in Hebrew, is here in the nephal stem. Dr. Searles writes, the 40 nephal forms of yada occur in diverse contexts with diverse subjects. In some cases, the nephal indicates a process whereby an existing state of affairs becomes known, like Leviticus 4.14 or Ruth 3.3. However, this process is not expressed inherently in the verb or the stem. Thus, the aspect of yada in the nephal stem must be determined from its immediate context rather than from deductive, quote-unquote, rules. The voice of the nifal is determined by the action of the verb in context. Stephen Boyd's synchronic study of the nifal in biblical Hebrew has demonstrated that this stem rarely, if ever, communicates a reflexive idea. So Dr. Searles recommends a translation of this verb like, I became known, or I would simply say, I was known. But many translations take this to be reflexive in meaning because of the nephal stem, and they translate it as, I did not make myself known. So there's a debate there. Now, the medieval commentator Rashi noted that if Exodus 6.3 was stating that God did not reveal a name to the patriarchs, then a different stem of yada would have been used. The hifil stem would indicate that Yahweh did not make known his name. But Rashi tersely notes that I did not make known is not written here. So Rashi's way out of this dilemma of the apparent contradiction was to say that the nifal form communicates that the patriarchs knew God's name Yahweh, but did not recognize him in his attribute of truth, quote unquote. To me, that just sounds like desperate punting and is not persuasive. Now, let me read to you Dr. Searle's interpretation of this dilemma and see what he says. In Exodus 6, 2 through 8, especially verse 7, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob suggested 
that he would reveal himself in a way that surpassed the patriarch's knowledge of him. Which is true. With new action would come new associations for the name Yahweh. Through the divine speech in Exodus 6, 2 through 8, Yahweh suggested that this would occur in Moses' days. The contrast between God's acts for the patriarchs and his promised acts for Moses' generation seems to justify his claim that he did not become known to the patriarchs with respect to his name. As with Exodus 3, 13 through 15, so Exodus 6, 3 anticipated future divine action. Both texts communicate that the future would reveal the whoever that Yahweh would be. However, this tentative conclusion appears to contradict a straightforward reading of Genesis. And he is absolutely right there. He continues, The patriarchs knew and used the name Yahweh regularly. R.W.L. Moberly rightly declares that if Exodus 6.3b means what it appears to say, the harmonizing approach is doomed. Unless there is strong biblical evidence for this distinction in the knowledge of Yahweh before and after Moses, those who argue for literary coherence have simply strained their interpretations of Exodus 6.3. That's a good way to put it, strained interpretations, and that's what we're dealing with here. Dr. Searles goes on to say, The complexity of the canonical text heightens the appeal of source-critical explanations. Documentarians assert that Exodus 6.3 is entirely coherent within P. When one isolates the major P texts, one can see a clear contrast between a god named El Shaddai, who made provisional promises, and Yahweh, who revealed his name to Moses for the first time. Therefore, the appearance and function of the name Yahweh in the canonical book of Genesis merits closer scrutiny. Now, if that all went over your head, that's understandable. We need to talk about the documentary hypothesis. That's what he's referring to here. It's one of the models historically used by liberal scholars to explain the origins and composition of the Torah, or Pentateuch. This is actually a really old hypothesis now, and it's been totally disproven, and I do not agree with it at all. I don't think it's helpful. But this is what happens when you approach the Bible from a purely Western, scientific, modern perspective. Basically, this idea posited that the Pentateuch is a compilation of four originally independent documents, the Yahwist, the Elohist, the Deuteronomist, and the priestly sources. So their answer to this is pretty simple. They say, well, the one guy, the Yahwist, he wrote the part with all the references to Yahweh, and then the other guy wrote this part where it says that they didn't know me by Yahweh. But at the same time, if this is the only way that we translate this verse, then it actually seems to give credence to the documentary hypothesis. Conservative interpreters often argue that the character of Yahweh was known partially in Genesis but was fully revealed in the book of Exodus. So they would take this statement to be metaphorical, and that's how they explain away the dilemma. It's not that they didn't know Yahweh's name as Yahweh, it's just that they hadn't seen it fully fleshed out, all that it represented and implied. In other words, they hadn't seen all the fullness of Yahweh's character as he was going to reveal himself in the Exodus redemption. But Dr. Searles rightly points out that the narrative occurrences of Yahweh and Genesis do not seem to represent Yahweh as partially known. The Genesis narrative makes known Yahweh's presence, his omnipresence, his blessing, and his power. The compound form Yahweh Elohim in Genesis 2.4 identifies Yahweh with the God who created the world. Yahweh created Adam from the dust, gave him a command, and created a wife for his benefit. Yahweh walked with his creatures, Genesis 3.8, was with Isaac and Jacob, and gave Joseph success in a foreign land. Yahweh cursed the ground and became heartbroken over humankind's corruption. Yahweh favored Noah and promised never to flood the earth again when he smelled Noah's offering. Similarly, Yahweh showed compassion on Lot, Genesis 19, 16. 
where he was called the everlasting God, and he made a covenant with Abram. Yahweh even extended mercy and grace to Joseph in Genesis 39, 21, which are traits that later became indelibly attached to his personal name. End quote. So can you see how this conservative interpretation, this attempt to get out of this dilemma, is rather strained? I honestly don't think a straightforward reading of this would get you there. And most readers are never going to be able to figure out this dilemma on their own just by a straightforward reading of the text. Once again, I read you just a few examples, but there are 165 uses of the name Yahweh in Genesis. And get this, 52 of them occur in direct speech. So it's not just that the narrator is filling in what we later found out that his name is Yahweh. No, in direct speech, he quotes these people calling Yahweh by his name. Dr. Searles once again points out another major challenge to this attempt to get around this dilemma. He says the two occurrences of Yahweh's self-introductory formula in the book of Genesis challenge any claim that Yahweh did not become known by name to the patriarchs. In Genesis 15, 7, the God of Abraham introduced himself with a theologically significant predicate. Here's what he says. I am Yahweh who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans. Any Israelite would recognize that Yahweh was here using Exodus language, thus identifying the God who called Abraham from Ur with the God who delivered Israel from Egypt. Yahweh presented himself to Jacob as he was leaving the land of promise, saying, I am Yahweh, God of Abraham your forefather, and God of Isaac, Genesis 28, 13. And then Searles writes, any casual reader of Genesis would assume that God had become known to the patriarchs by the name Yahweh. So by now, I hope you've felt the horns of this dilemma. And I want to introduce you to Dwayne Garrett's, Dr. Dwayne Garrett's commentary on Exodus, published back in 2014. This is the only commentary that I have found that actually offers what I find to be a compelling solution to all of this. So here is what he offers as his translation, and then we'll get into the commentary of why. He translates, And I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, but my name is Yahweh. Did I not make myself known to them? Once again, that last part is, But my name is Yahweh. Did I not make myself known to them? And here goes his commentary. First, this is a poetic strophe. And as translated above, it demonstrates the ABBA parallelism that Hebrew poetry often employs. The standard translation, but by my name, has no such parallelism. Second, Ushami Yahweh does not mean by my name, Yahweh. It means, and my name is Yahweh. One might argue that the preposition bet on be'el is doing double duty, but be'el shaddai is not truly parallel to the supposed counterpart phrase, ushami Yahweh, and by my name, Yahweh. A true parallel would be uva Yahweh, but as Yahweh. A word used for double duty should have parallel functions in both phrases. Also, one would expect to see a double duty preposition governing two nouns in the same clause rather than nouns in two separate clauses. It is especially odd to have a double duty preposition first in a positive clause and then in a negated clause. I think that's a really good point. Next, he says, this poem does not elsewhere use double duty prepositions. C63A, 66E through F, 68D. Third, it is not unreasonable to take line 63D as a rhetorical question instead of as a negative statement. And I'm going to give you some examples of this here in a second. So he says, the interrogative particle, hey, 
is not necessary, particularly since context in line 63a makes it plain that God did reveal himself to the patriarchs. Fourth, if the text had meant to say that God did not reveal the name Yahweh to the patriarchs, a clear and unambiguous way of doing so would be velo hodati shemi Yahweh, but I did not make known my name Yahweh to them. Next, Dr. Garrett goes on to undermine W. Randall Garr's analysis of this whole issue in his book, The Grammar and Interpretation of Exodus. I think Garrett's answer to Gar is completely compelling, but it's a little complicated to communicate here without some visuals. Now, he continues saying, The repetition of I am Yahweh in Exodus 6 is certainly not meant to be a revelation of a name that no one had ever heard of before. It is not even, as some suggest, filling out the name Yahweh with new meaning and content. The main point is not novelty but continuity. He made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob regarding their offspring and the land of Canaan, and now he is fulfilling those promises. Furthermore, just as he was the Father's God and in covenant with them, now he is the God of all of Israel, entering into covenant with them. In fact, one could hardly more badly misread the text than to claim that Exodus 6 is the revelation of something new. It is the completion of something very old. It was no new God that was going to save Israel from Egypt. It was the God the fathers had known. If he had come in a different name, he would have been a different God, or he would have been the kind of pagan God that the Egyptians knew so well, one that could easily merge identities and traits with another god. But such a god would not have been the I Am of Exodus. There is one element of the oracle poem that is somewhat new. In keeping with Exodus 3.15, the poem reinforces the demand that henceforth the standard name for the God of Israel is Yahweh. That is, Israelites are to routinely use Yahweh when referring to their God. This does not mean that the use of any other name from that time forward was absolutely forbidden, and it does not mean that they had never heard of Yahweh before. But God would not be described under a chaotic multitude of names. This is different from Egypt, where different gods might be thought of at times as separate beings and at times as merged. Thus, Bastet, a protective domestic cat, might or might not be thought of as a variant of Sekhmet, a ferocious lioness. And indeed, Sekhmet could be thought of as the alter ego of Hathor, the cow goddess of fertility. Re was the ancient sun god, but he could be thought of as merged into Horus, son of Osiris and Isis, as the eye of Horus, or as Horus, the sun on the horizon. True devotion to one god, in fact, would be difficult for Israel to achieve if Israel's god went by numerous names. Thus, while understanding that the occasional use of Shaddai or some other name was not forbidden, the regular name they were to use for God was Yahweh. For that reason, when the narrator speaks in Job, as opposed to the reported speeches of the ancient protagonist and his opponents, God is routinely called Yahweh. Job 1, 6, 7, 8, 9, 2, 1, etc. For this reason also, we should note, it is entirely wrong to think that a P or E, referring to the documentary hypothesis, would avoid using Yahweh in the Genesis narrative. They would have thought it their duty to use Yahweh to make the point that Yahweh was the God who led the patriarchs, even if they thought that the patriarchs themselves did not know the name. The whole oracle of Exodus 6 is predicated on the proposition that he will be the same God to Israel, that he was to the patriarchs, that he remains Yahweh. Beyond that, we should note that the whole purpose of this oracle is to vindicate Moses, to reassure him and to reassure the nation, in contrast to the poetic imprecation laid upon Moses in Yahweh's name, Yahweh himself vindicates Moses. But in terms of actual content, 
There is nothing at all here that is new. In fact, the oracle does little more than repeat what Yahweh had already told Moses on Mount Sinai. And this is the whole point. Moses did not need some new information about God. He needed reassurance. The reassurance was a repetition of the words of faith he had already heard. Moses was fairly skeptical after his interview at the bush in Exodus 3 through 4. One might hope that he was now ready to accept the message, but this was not yet the case. End quote. Now, Garrett is actually not alone in this interpretation and solution. A number of years before Garrett published his commentary, Anderson, in his book, The Sentence in Biblical Hebrew, says the following, Recognition of this parallelism solves an old problem. Misled by the apparent negative lo and the sequence el Shaddai, interpreters translated, and by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them and made inferences about the history of the word Yahweh, about sources and other things. All forced. The emphasis is on what God has done, not a historical note about what he did not do. The parallelism with Ani Yahweh, I am Yahweh, shows that Shemi Yahweh, my name is Yahweh, is a conjunctive clause of identical structure and not an apposition phrase. In the following speech, the repeated Ani Yahweh makes an inclusio. There is similar parallelism between the interlacing clauses. I showed myself to Abraham, Israel, and Jacob, dot, 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 dot. I made myself known to them. This compels recognition of lo, the the negator, typically the negative, as assertative. There is no hint So, as a rhetorical question, basically. There is no hint in Exodus that Yahweh was a new name revealed first to Moses. On the contrary, the success of his mission depended on the use of the familiar name for validation by the Israelites. Moses interrogated the revealer precisely to convince himself that it really was the God of the ancestors who had called him. End quote. So, is it true that you could translate this as a rhetorical question without the question marker, which is typically the he prefix? Well, it is true, and English translations actually do this. The very same English translations that do not translate Exodus 6.3 as a rhetorical question. So, here are a few cases. Jonah 4.11. First in Hebrew, Va'ani lo ahus al Nineveh ha'id hagedola. So, literally, and I will not show pity upon Nineveh, the great city. All the English translations understand this to be a rhetorical question because of the context. The context absolutely demands this. Why would God all of a sudden say, Oh, and I'm not going to show mercy. I'm not going to pity Nineveh. No, all of them say, and should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, KJV? And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, NASB? And should I not have compassion on Nineveh? Net, should I not be even more concerned about Nineveh, NIV? And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? It's unanimous, but there is no interrogative, hey, in that sentence. Another example comes from Lamentations 3.38. All English versions take this as a rhetorical question, although in the same way as Jonah 4.11, it does not have the interrogative, hey, it does not have the question marker. So, they translate this as, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Or NASB, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? NIV, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? But in Hebrew, it's just a simple statement without the question marker. But the context absolutely, unequivocally demands it. So, we should pay attention to context 
And I, that's what I'm encouraging scholars to do with Exodus 6.3 in this case. Let's look at another example. 1 Samuel 20, verse 9. And Jonathan said, Far be it from you, if I knew that it was determined by my father that harm should come to you, would I not tell you? So that last part, would I not tell you? In Hebrew is just simply, I would not tell you. But the context absolutely demands that we interpret this as a rhetorical question. All of the English translations do this. NIV, if I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? So here's the thing that's absolutely astonishing to me. It is linguistically defensible to translate it this way in Exodus 6.3 as a question. And there are other people who think that you should translate it as a question. In addition to all this, it solves a major problem and apparent contradiction. So, why would you not put this in an English translation? Maybe some English translations put it as a footnote. To, to, to my knowledge, so far, I have not found any English translation that puts this at least as a footnote alternative. English translations tend to be full of alternate readings, alternate ways to translate something in all kinds of places, even places that aren't even that important. But this seems like such a hugely important place, and nobody puts even a note that says, hey, this could be translated this way as well, if that serves you. So, I thought, well, at least surely the United Bible Society's the translator's handbook would have something like this, an alternative rendering that they suggest. So I went and looked it up, and lo and behold, they have nothing, absolutely nothing to say. They do not address the issue of this alternative. They give translators no other option but to translate this as a negative clause. So Bible editors, Bible translators out there, It's great, you know, if you're listening to this, it's great if you have a really strong opinion as to why to translate it as a negative clause, but given the alternative and all the benefits it carries with it, and the fact that it is very linguistically defensible, and all those amazing arguments that are very, very compelling from Garrett, I see it as very irresponsible at this point, if you're aware of this, to not include this as a footnote in your versions, and to not give this as an option to Bible translators that you're working with. I, for one, am not hesitant at all to embrace changing in the main text this to a rhetorical question, as Garrett suggests. I don't think you lose anything and you gain everything. So anyway, that's why I'm doing a podcast on this because this seems to be a really important solution that absolutely nobody is talking about and no English translation is giving any credit to. Anyway, I hope this has been helpful. I just want to give you guys an update. I'm working on some big and important projects right now, and I've got some increased responsibilities. So the podcasts may not be as regular as they have been in the past, but I'll try my best. It might end up being every two weeks for a while. So just keep that in mind. Thank you for listening. This has been Working for the Word, where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey, and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help you treasure the Bible more, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1. Psalm 1.